Hola! This is the Filmlings Podcast World Tour, a special summer series where we explore filmmaking from around the world. Yo soy Jonathan. Y yo soy Alex. Y esta es la semana 28, México Macabro. Si, sí, senor. Uh, <laughs> we are talking about Mexican filmmaking this week, and it, yet again, uh, went someplace that I did not expect it to go. And that's been the funnest part about this uh this series so far for me um and i'm speaking about how we accidentally created a theme week again right which we kind of did with uh japan where it was all like family movies um and now in mexico where we have like this fate uh thread thread of fate that's a classical greek um ideology right yeah, 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 the three fates. I, I'm specifically thinking about the Disney version of Hercules at the moment, but <laughs> I, I'm sure that's in reference to something that actually was part of Greek mythology. Yeah, I believe it was. Anyway, um, yeah, we're we're going south of the border of um, America and looking at three films that aren't like a specific movement or don't necessarily like have this one grand thing to say about Mexican film, but they are very interesting to look at. And uh, yeah, we, we pulled some stuff out that we weren't really expecting. Yeah, yeah, not at all. Uh, so the first film we're going to talk about this week is Macario from 1960. Um, and it's by far the oldest film we're talking about this week, but it's super interesting. Uh, it was directed by Roberto Galvedon. Um, not a very well-known name these days, uh, at least to many of us here, but uh, apparently he was quite pro- prolific, directed a whole bunch of films back in the mid-century in Mexico, um, and this was the first Mexican film to be nominated for the Best Foreign Language Film category at the Oscars. Right, and actually all three of these films were nominated for Best Foreign Language Oscar, uh, although none of them actually won. And our second one that we'll be talking about is 2000's Amores Perros by Alejandro Inarritu, um, who we have seen before on the podcast. He directed Birdman um, back in our Oscar bait episode. Um, So, yeah, like I said, this was nominated for Best Foreign Language Oscar as well, but did not win. And this is Inarritu's first feature length film, um, and it's kind of crazy deep uh for a first feature yeah yeah it's ambitious to say the least right um and the final film we're going to be talking about today is pan's labyrinth from 2006 um this one's super well known directed by guillermo del toro um and it was also nominated for the best foreign language film category in the oscars it won for cinematography art direction and makeup right pan's labyrinth is quite famous uh del toro is um you know kind of household name he's uh been around the block and this is his kind of magnum opus of creature and um dark story films dark fantasy yeah dark yeah. fantasy there or you know. pale fantasy uh, 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 uh. <laughs> that character's we'll not in there that long that was that was the most shocking bit for me because he He was the most identifiable part of the film for me before I watched it. And then I watched it and he's barely in there. Yeah, that's what I thought the first time I watched it a couple months ago, too. Um, But we'll we'll get to that uh, shortly. Right, right. Uh, So, Jonathan, do you want to uh, break down Macario for us? Macario from 1960 is an interesting film in kind of the the mass canon of the filmlings because this film plays like a parable. So the film follows a a poor man with a family um, in Mexico, but way back when like the Spanish were still in charge of Mexico. Um, And he is very distraught because he has um, several children. Uh, He had three or four kids and there's not enough for them all to eat. Were there five? Okay, there, there, it was a, a bunch. That was the point um, too. Was that there was a bunch of kids, right? He had a lot of kids, and there wasn't quite enough food, so he would often go hungry. And kind of his one wish was to have a turkey all to himself that he didn't have to share, and he could eat alone in peace. 
And so his <laughs> wife ends up getting mad at some rich people that she's working for and steals one of their turkeys and cooks it for him. Um, and so he goes off into the woods to eat this turkey by himself. And along the way, he runs into the devil, God, and death and ends up sharing the turkey with death. And death, in return, gives him a... Uh, a jar, I don't know, a gourd, like a jug. <laughs> it, yeah, it looks like a gourd, but it's essentially a jug of of uh, water with uh, healing powers. Right. So Macario, our eponymous character, he takes the healing water back, and Death's little provision for this healing water is whenever he goes to use it on someone. Um, if death stands at the foot of the bed, he will appear to him when he's alone. If death stands at the foot of the bed, then the person will live. If he stands at the head of the bed, then the person will die. So if the per if he's standing at the foot of the bed, he can use the water and it will heal them. Um, so the first person he uses it on is his son. And then word quickly spreads and um, he goes around healing lots of people, doing lots of good, becoming very famous. And then uh, the viceroys of the Spanish Inquisition get wind of it, and no one conflict the ensues. Spanish Inquisition, <laughs> right? I really uh, did not expect them in this film. <laughs> yeah, so that happens, and then there's a conflict, and I won't spoil the ending because it does have a twist ending, very Twilight Zoney. Um, yeah, we got Shyamalan. It's Twilight Zoney in a lot of respects. Um, yeah, it does. It does have that very uh, Twilight Zone feel to it where it's like a parable and there's a grand lesson to be learned by the character. Um, and every part of the journey definitely feels like a moral part of a journey where he's trying to figure out what this lesson is mixed in with that big feel of uh, a Christmas carol, like almost exactly with three people uh, showing up to you, except those three people aren't ghosts. They're the devil, God and death. Right. And it, it has that uh, like folklore quality um, to it that, you know, like Rip Van Winkle or Sleepy Hollow almost has where um, it's he Macario, as he runs into these characters, he's not surprised. He's not confused. He knows exactly who they are and how to react to them in a sense, like whether he reacts in the best way to each of the characters can kind of be thrown up for debate. But it's not it's not this thing where it's like oh he's just a normal person uh and then th he's like having to learn oh i was actually having a turkey with death what no like like he kind of just accepts it and knows who these people are as he goes along which i thought was really interesting because usually you get that uh stumbling block time period when a character runs into um a a uh the, the unknown the fantastical yeah he trips on yeah. the threshold at the 30 minute mark yeah and this movie um keeps surprising you in ways like that um especially what you were talking about with um macario knowing who the characters are in the way the plot progresses with the way the characters interact with each other with um with the surprise twist ending at the end which we won't spoil um while we're in the no spoilers section and also just like the first 20 minutes of the film i did not understand what the scope of this film was going to be in the first uh 20 minutes like i thought it was just going to be about a guy who really wanted to eat a turkey <laughs> um and and that that's what the entire film was going to be about and then it pulled the rug out from under me and surprised me again and that is a great sign of of good storytelling and great entertainment and good filmmaking right and especially since we've just a couple weeks ago come off of um other films from europe like bicycle thieves which you know, the the uh, Italian neorealist could have taken a premise like this poor man just wants to eat a turkey and run with it for a whole film and kind <laughs> yeah. of built built their moral themes off of that. And this does feel very um, bicycle thieves esque. Uh, going back to that, either coming from Citizen Kane or Bicycle Thieves, this one definitely is in the vein of Bicycle Thieves, uh, but it it takes it in a more fantastical direction and uh, expounds its themes in a, you know, less physical and real uh, sense. Yeah. Yeah. And we also, I will say we picked a very 
um, a very Mexican movie for our, our world tour Mexico week, um, because it's about the day of the dead. Um, and there it's just filled up with all of the images, the images from Mexican culture that you would expect to see, like, uh, sombreros and, uh, all the day of the dead skulls everywhere. And a, a fairly long sequence in the middle that acts as a montage of, um, of Macario going through and doing all of his healing in the town, which is accompanied by a mariachi song that explains that uh, how great Macario is and how much good he's doing for the town and stuff like that. And it's just describing it in the same way to the ways that we saw in Bahu Bali, where some of the music would literally describe the scene that's taking place um, as we're transitioning from one scene to another or uh, elapsing time. I thought that was, that was really interesting because putting it in a mariachi is like that's the kind of thing that would be done as like a parody nowadays. But that was a legitimate technique. Yeah, yeah, it was really fun to see. And uh, the thing that was going through my head when I saw that was it reminded me of um, a Western film, partly because uh, Mexico is such a popular uh, setting for so many uh, Western films made in the U.S., um, but it also because it reminded me of some of those songs you would occasionally hear in older Western films that were literally just singing about the legend that we were watching on screen as it unfolded. Yeah. Um, and like, singing like Django. The praises. Yeah. Uh, and singing the praises of the lead character or telling the dangers of the lead character. Um, almost like the, the chorus of, a of a play or something like that. Am I using chorus correctly? Is that what a chorus does? Or the yeah, the just... chorus addresses the audience, um, usually, you know, a group of people, three or five or whatever, and they will kind of guide us through the story. So I think that that does apply. And if you want to kind of attach chorus to um, the idea of a mariachi band, there's <laughs> a film called Rango, which is an animated film starring Johnny Depp which literally has a chorus of little desert owls that are a mariachi band, but they are the chorus also. There are three of them, and they, it, they like, at each scene transition, will pop in and say, okay, so this is what's going on, and soon Rango will be dead. But he keeps, like, getting through all these things. But it's, it's used to comedic effect there, but that was kind of... An, that's what this reminded me of, because, as again, as I said, that's kind of a parody on this mariachi song but here it's it's still being used as the literal technique yeah it's it's the or it's it's closer to the origins of the technique before people are riffing on that technique uh right. for comedic effect which is the fate of all techniques really um and then it'll come back in vogue and then it'll swing back to being funny to use and then it'll come back in vogue um and eventually we all die and if that's not the message of macario <laughs> I don't know what is. Or this whole week, because as we've titled week. this episode, Macabre Mexico, it was, again, very sad. Not quite as sad as Japan, but um, not a lot of happy endings, or at least um, not straightforwardly happy endings. Yeah, Japan was the kind of death that hits close to home, because um, we were talking about all these very realistic um uh, family-based films that were highly relatable and then this week we talk about these very fantastical big movies um that are i mean uh, amores peros, peros i guess is meant to be uh relatable to a certain extent but it is definitely large um so so when people die it feels like a character dying in a tale rather than um like your mom dying right um which isn't bad it's just different <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a different kind of conflict. Um, and the other thing that we should kind of touch on with Macario is the way that it is kind of, I mean, clearly it's a fantastical um, story, but the storytelling itself can be very uh, fantastical. And I'll go ahead and throw the word expressionist out there, um, which we're going to talk about very soon. Uh, but this definitely is coming from a tradition of, um, you know, German expressionism and some kind of fantasy elements. There's lots of smoke happening. Uh, there are some built up sets that are very specifically designed and feel big, but still also feel like sets, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, there's this really 
uh, weird, wacky scene somewhere between German Expressionism and uh, Louis Bunuel uh, style surrealism, like early surrealism from Bunuel and Dali, um, where Macario is dreaming of what else? Eating a turkey. Um, and there's a bunch of like puppet figures, like done up, like Day of the Dead type figures, and they're like fighting over the turkey and eating turkey and singing and dancing and stuff. And it's it's very odd. Um, it's it it would in no way be considered, I think, um, traditional filmmaking. It it definitely derives its sense of style from some of those more out there movements like expressionism and like surrealism. Yeah, and it's one of those interesting things to me because, you know, the idea of a story or a play within a play and some I mean, goes back at least to Shakespeare, probably well before, um, you there, know, with there's Hamlet's. There's probably some Greek play floating out there with a play within it. Right. I mean, but pro- kind of most famously is Hamlet's, uh, the play's the thing to catch the conscience of the king, where he puts on the the play of the murderous uncle for his uncle and stuff like that. But when that technique is used, it's often kind of boiled way down into a melodrama or a very uh, um, easy to recognize pieces. So we have a bunch of skeletons sitting at a table with lots of food. Okay, those are the rich people. We have a bunch of other skeletons behind bars. Okay, those are the poor people. They don't have the food. All they can do is look on at the rich people eating the food, and eventually all the skeletons behind the bars break through the bars and burst upon all the (laughs) skeletons that are eating them and like basically start beating them and then eat their turkeys and stuff like that. So it's really strange, but it's really basic. And that, I mean, we see that a lot if there's ever like a puppet show or um, some something that a character is watching in the... uh, in the story that we're watching, it probably has some relevance. Like even taking it back to Broken Flowers in our second episode where he's watching Don Juan and a scene that perfectly sums up all the themes that Jarmouche covers throughout the rest of the film. Yeah, exactly. And we see the same thing in The 400 Blows where the two boys are watching a puppet show. Um, And it's just a really nice way to bring in some symbolic uh, meaningfulness for the film uh, without really distracting from the film itself. And it's also, I do appreciate the fact that it is a, uh, each little scene like that is kind of an homage in and of itself to uh, the genre of storytelling and the love that the storytellers who are making the film um, have for storytelling and watching storytelling. And sometimes that's the case, sometimes that's not always the case, but there certainly is um, a prevalence of movie watching in a lot of movies yeah and i think i mean as we've been talking about like beyond movie watching but like any kind of story watching within a story basically i bring this up to say if you see that happening you kind of have to do a click in your brain and say okay i have to watch what they're watching in view of the larger story that I'm watching. Because oftentimes you can kind of predict where the story is going by taking in the things that are being presented. They're used for foreshadowing very often. Um, even, I was just thinking back to Amadeus, when he goes to like the the children's theater and they put on like this farcical slapstick version of one of his grand operas. Um, and it kind of reflects the farcical nature that is himself where on one hand he has created these great and eloquent masterpieces. And on the other hand, he is this bumbling drunkard, uh, womanizer of a man and he's kind of a farce of himself. So just anytime you see something like that, you kind of have to take a step back and just start thinking, okay, what do these basic images that I'm seeing have to do with the larger narrative that I'm experiencing? Yeah, yeah, it's always important to pay attention uh, to that stuff, if, especially if you want to try to guess the ending. Maybe if you don't, uh, just let it simmer in the back of your subconscious and generate that eerie feeling, that foreshadowing uh, is so good at doing. Um, but sometimes the stuff happening on the TV is actually part of the main narrative and you just don't know it. 
um, until later in the film because it's all complicated and pulp fictiony in the way it tells its story, uh, much like our next film, Amores Peros. Yeah, so do you want to, I mean, we do this a lot where I say, do you want to try and sum this one up? But um, um, we're back at it. So try and sum up Amores Peros, Alex, if you can. Yeah, yeah. I know. I don't think it's. I don't think it's too hard because at its base, it's really just a story about how dogs are fantastic and we don't deserve <laughs> them as people, um, and people are terrible. Um, no, I kid. That's Although, not wrong. That might be true. That might be true. Um, I'm a big dog lover. I'm. I'm a huge dog lover. Unfortunately, I've never been in a position in my life where I can take care of a dog properly. Um, hopefully soon, but. Just uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Keep that in your back pocket as you listen to our uh, discussion on Amores Peros because it was a big part of the film. And a quick translation of Amores Peros, um, it roughly means, or it doesn't roughly mean, it means um, loves a bitch, uh, which is definitely a central theme. But uh, Pero also means uh, dog, um, or it can mean dog, or my Spanish isn't great, but that's what I've been told. Um, and it certainly makes sense with the theme of the film, which definitely deals with um, the loyalty of people and dogs and how that loyalty interacts with the love um, that people have for each other and for dogs, um, the dogs in their life specifically, not dogs as a species. But they are used as a very handy and a very um, prominent uh, reflection of Uh, how the humans in the film act and uh, the way the these dogs act and there's a very significant dog in each uh, each of the three stories that are told told over the course of the film that reflect back on to the main character of that film but uh, like I just mentioned this story is told in three parts um, that are more or less concurrent but told one after the other with bits of the other ones thrown into each um, as we move along, and like I said a second ago, it's very Pulp Fiction-y um, in that way that the uh, the narrative is kind of cut up, so you're not getting it in a precise order, um, and that can make it maybe kind of hard to follow, but at the same time really fun as you watch and you see these characters um, morph from mysteries to deep and complex and real on screen. And specifically, the three stories we're going to talk about that happen in Amaros, uh, Amores Peros are, one, the story of uh, the younger brother of a family who is an adult um, and wants to run away with his older brother's um, wife and their kid and their soon-to-be um, second kid who uh, the wife is pregnant with. Um, and to do that, he takes his family's dog, um, to dog fighting rings and he fights him for money because apparently his dog is really really good and at the same time he's trying to convince his sister-in-law to run away with him and you can imagine that being complicate uh being complex real fast um the second story that happens in the film is the story of a supermodel and the man who left his family to be with her um who actually runs the ad agency who who hires her most of the time. Um, her dog gets lost beneath the floorboards of their new apartment, and a lot of shenanigans ensue. And we'll get to the specifics here in a minute, but that's pretty much the basic setup. Um, other than that, she was injured in a crash, um, the same car crash that injured people at the end of the first story, but I won't tell you which people because I don't want to spoil it. Um, see, this is complicated. This is a complicated <laughs> movie. We're uh, treading lightly. Yeah, stay with me here. I'm trying not to spoil anything. I'm trying to keep it interesting, but I'm trying also to set it up enough so what we're about to say afterwards makes sense. Um, and the final story we talk about is the story of a very old, um, not really homeless, but... Uh, it's kind of pseudo homeless. homeless man. He's like squatting in um in a very old like abandoned apartment that his cop friend lent him. Um, the same cop friend who um arrested him long long ago. And I won't go into his backstory because that's revealed over the course of the film. Um, but you should know that he's essentially an assassin. 
Um, and he, we see him kill somebody very early in the film during the first story, um, which is a nice setup for what happens later on. And he, his, uh, his backstory comes into conflict with, um, quote, the one last job that he's, he's going to pull off that he's been hired to do. Um, and the car the one crash, last quote unquote is a big deal in this movie. It's a big deal in this movie. Um, and the car crash that so impacted the first two storylines also impacts this one. It stops him from uh, committing the assassination or murder or whatever um, the first time around and leads to further complications down the line, as well as bringing the dog from the first, um, the first story segment into his life towards the end of the film, which is a nice end cap, I think. Um, well, and also it brings complications. Kofi. Yeah, good right. for Kofi. He's not dead. Um, but yes, it's very complicated. It's it's hard to follow when you talk about it afterwards, but it leaves you with this um, with this sense of umph. It's a it's a it's a it's a film that sticks with you, um, and, and you simmer on after you watch it for a very long time. Um, especially if you're a dog lover and you look up to see how they did the <laughs> dog fights to make sure none of the dogs got hurt. Which um, it seems like they're none of brutally them got hurt. shot. Yeah, yeah, they are edited extremely well. They're edited um, in the style of the film, which we'll talk about here in a second, which is very jittery, um, and the sound design that goes on top of it is very good. And then, of course, they just like throw buckets of fake blood into the ring and on the dogs, so that right. it looks like they're super bloody when they're not. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, that the film is Pulp Fiction-y. And so just to reiterate, Pulp Fiction comes out in 1994. Quentin Tarantino um, directed it, and it made a huge splash in the way, especially uh, younger directors were thinking about movies because it was told so unconventionally in this kind of vignette that all meshes together. Um, And this is almost like the same kind of setup, but it's so distinct and so well done. In fact, the film opens almost in the exact same way that Reservoir Dogs opens. Did you notice that, Alex? Yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Because Reservoir Dogs starts with this car speeding down the road with a man that's bleeding all over the seats and everything in a car, and the person in the passenger seat is leaning back and yelling, and they're all of this tension, Amoris Peros opens with a dog bleeding in the back of a car. There's blood everywhere. The car is racing through the streets and the passenger is yelling and screaming and trying to help the dog. It's almost like, and then the fact that Reservoir Dogs is called Reservoir Dogs. Like, it's almost a direct yeah. reference to, hey, Quentin Tarantino has had a pretty big influence on me. Um, so I thought that that was really interesting. But it is, it's kind of coming in this wave of films post uh, Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs um, where people were thinking about narrative differently. And this is uh, this is just a prime example of how that kind of influence can still like even though it's heavily influenced by Tarantino, it is still distinct and very good uh, just on its own merits. Certainly, certainly. And uh, another filmmaker that we have to talk about in relation to Amoris Peros is, of course, Louis Bunuel, who himself was actually um, had had a very large segment of his career and a very successful segment of his career in Mexico. And a lot of his uh, best films uh, came from that period, including uh, one that we talked about on this podcast, The Exterminating Angel. Yeah, and Exterminating Angel kind of uh, this the second segment of of Amores Peros kind of reminded me of that, and also uh, Roger Ebert had made this kind of connection. I'll include a link of his review to Amores Peros uh, in the blog post. But basically, in this in a similar way to the fact that no one would leave the room in Exterminating Angel, uh, it's also this kind of question that you're left with in the second segment where the dog falls through this hole in the floorboards but never goes back to the hole even when they put food there and he just kind of whimpers in other places in the room until they end up like tearing up half the floor and all of this stuff 
Um, and so it's like, it's definitely being used as a symbol more than maybe a literal, uh, situation. Um, it's kind of interesting. You kind of have this, uh, weird dichotomy going on with that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I can't actually remember what the dog's name is, which is funny because she just keeps saying it throughout the entire Richie. segment. Okay. There you go. There you go. But I thought, you know, a better name for the dog would have been McGuffin. But <laughs> that is true. Uh, we've talked about MacGuffins before where it's a it's an element to drive the plot along that the characters care about. But, you know, it doesn't really affect the audience one way or another. Yeah. It's like, why is the dog staying in the sub floor instead of going up through the hole? Because the script because says it has so. to create conflict. <laughs> right. We need tension somehow. Um, and inconvenient th- things can happen as long as it makes life harder for the characters. And that that segment of the film has another uh, little side symbol with the I love you balloon, which was interestingly in English. Uh, but there's this balloon that he uh, gets the the model after she comes back from the hospital from the car crash that slowly deflates as the tension between them escalates throughout that segment. Yeah, yeah. There's a very strong um, use of symbolism throughout the film, which is really impressive considering how much thought must have gone into um, mixing up uh, the the storytelling and the order in which you reveal certain information over the course of um, what is a fairly long film. Yeah, I mean, it's two and a half hours, so it's about, you know, normal uh, film length as far as a decently linked film but there's so much going on that you're like going back and forth and it feels much longer because you feel like you've gotten three stories in the time it generally takes to tell one yeah yeah and are they even really three stories or are they just one um and i think that's part of it too is the interconnectedness of the lives of all these people in this town this kind of i don't think it's even mentioned you know where they're living it's just some mexico city City. oh it is mexico city okay but i mean the in the the way that all of these people's lives uh just touch each other um from here and you know what that's actually another uh kind of connection if we wanted to bring to bunuel as far as um if you look at the Phantom of Liberty, which we didn't in our episode, but it it kind of follows this this um, arc of we go to one story and then we follow a minor character from that story out into a different little uh, scene. And then we follow a minor character from that scene out and it just kind of traces us in this big, weird circle. And in that one, it didn't really, you know, mean a whole lot, but, you know, those influences from Bunuel can be seen here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, just in the sense of um, social commentary, um, presenting, first of all, the uh, a world that is very much um, dog-eat-dog, no pun intended, or maybe a little. Um, it's so sad. I love dogs. Anyway, um, but but also the fact that all three of our stories take place in very different economic circles. Um, the second story in the film is basically the bourgeoisie. You know, it's a supermodel and a guy who runs a magazine. Um, and yeah, maybe he's short in cash during the film because he's getting a divorce, but that doesn't mean he's not part of the bourgeoisie. And then you have a working class family in the first um, in the first segment, yeah, they're not in a great situation, uh, and they're they're working hard for their money, and they're trying to make ends meet. But they're or, certainly not you homeless, know, like the cheating person. and stealing. Right, right. That's very true. The yeah, <laughs> don't feel too bad for the older brother either, because he's not a great person. Um, like I said before, this isn't a movie about great people. It's about bad people being mean to dogs and each other, <laughs> I guess, but mostly to dogs. Uh, Wow. I hope nobody thinks that, like, like I'm really just getting up on my high horse about um, being a dog lover here. Like, I'm not actually misinterpreting how this film works. Um, I just want to say that, too. Um, but, yes, I do love dogs, and I will make a big deal out of it. But, yeah, <laughs> even our even our third story takes place as, like, you know, a homeless guy who seems pretty much homeless by choice towards the end. He He's, like, on this uh, self-flagellation um, self-punishment 
um, kick where he's like, I have screwed up so much stuff. I don't deserve to be part of society. Uh, I will live with the dogs. Um, literally, he lives with a bunch yeah. of dogs. Because um, he's offered money and he refuses it. And when he does have money, he gives it away to... I mean, that's part of his backstory. But um, but again, yeah, it's like you're saying, that's an intentional choice. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like we should also talk about the cinematography of this film. Because if the uh, storytelling doesn't lend itself... Um, to being slightly disorienting um, and mesmerizing. Well, the cinematography definitely, definitely lends itself to being disorienting, which is perfect for uh, the gritty, ground-level, intense, personal, intimate stories that are being told. Um, but it's it's definitely a, a far cry um, from what you see in Macario or Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, and it's interesting because we've seen cinematography similar to this before so basically i would characterize it as very close it's a lot of very close-up shots handheld handheld yeah um but we've seen that like in upstream color in breathless in uh nobody knows but this one felt maybe it was just like because there was more energy and movement in the handheld um aspects um but i i don't know it it feels like you're like in there, like you're in these characters' faces, and uh, it it just leaves you on edge the whole time. Yeah, um, you can get it feels really, so really close, uncomfortable when you're really up in these close ups on uh, on people's faces, where you can see like um, the other characters' reflection in their eyes. Um, yeah, because you're you're so close, and it, and with people that you would not want to be that close with, because you know a lot of these characters are very volatile, and it's like. You're, he's putting you right up close to them and it just makes you very uncomfortable the whole time, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah, and that was definitely the part of it. And you're right, it feels like um, the, the cameraman drank like 10 cups of coffee and then was like, <laughs> let me hold the camera still now. Um, but it was intentional. It, it definitely was. Um, and and not works. even like in the way that if you think about the the Jason Bourne movies, those are close and kind of shaky, but more in like a voyeuristic way where there are a lot of long um, lenses and stuff that looks like you're looking through a telescope at people. Um, but in this film, it's it's wider. It's probably more close to the mid range, like 50 millimeter that kind of resembles the the human field of vision. So, it, I mean, again, it's just all these elements that pile together to make you feel like you are in the middle of the film, which kind of a lot of movies claim, but this one, maybe it's the, the, the strangeness of the subject matter or something about it really does put you in the middle of the action. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you know what, uh, look, if you look forward at, um, some of, uh, in, in uh, future work after Amoris Peros, especially Birdman, which we already talked about on this podcast, um, which also has a very weird, very disorienting uh, feel about it um, in the subject matter and the way it's presented. It does feel really close because you're sticking uh, partly because of the camera work and partly because of the way um, the the story is told, sticking with the one char- the one character twenty four seven for the duration of the film. But um, it definitely seems to be something that Inarito favors. Right, and you mentioned Birdman, and I'd also throw into the mix um, The Revenant that Inaritu also directed. And on those two films, he used uh, a different cinematographer. He used uh, Emmanuel Lubezki, whose kind of trademark is using very wide lenses, very close to people's faces. So when that happens, you get faces that kind of bulge towards the screen, and it, it feels disorienting. And... That's a way to get close, but it still feels it still puts a distance there because it kind of warps the screen. And so it doesn't feel like uh, reality, whereas this one with cinematographer Rodrigo Prieto, uh, it it feels just more straightforward. Like I was saying, with probably 50 millimeter lenses or maybe 35 millimeter lenses that just feel um, like like the way you would actually see it happening if you were a couple feet away from whatever's going on. Less than a couple feet. 
Yeah. Like some of the characters, especially in the first um in the uh the the first segment get really close to the camera. Um like whenever Octavio, the main character from the first segment is trying to convince his sister-in-law to run away with him, he is right up on that camera. Like it's just his his eyes and the the top of it, the bridge of his nose. Um and th- those shots are really um really good looking, but they are really intimate too. Yeah, and the other thing is that this it, all of these things put together come off to create a very gritty feeling which we've kind of been describing. And it's not a film that, you know, just in its entirety I would describe as a beautiful film. There are ways to shoot grittiness in a kind of uh beautiful and aesthetically pleasing way. Think of some of the Christopher Nolan films like the the Dark Knight trilogy. Um, but this one doesn't come off that way. And it's interesting because Rodrigo Prieto uh, has gone on to create some a lot of uh, really well-known films that are incredibly beautifully shot. So you think The Wolf of Wall Street and Argo or Silence uh, recently in Passengers that have a very different feel. And it's interesting we haven't talked a lot about um, cinematographers on the podcast yet, uh, except for maybe Kaminsky, and I don't remember if we mentioned uh, Lubezki specifically in Birdman. I assume we did. Um, but pr- this is kind of a cool way to see Prieto, uh, his growth from this very early film to some of these big, big films that everyone is kind of familiar with at this point. Yeah, yeah, and I think it goes to show that uh, cinematography isn't just about um, a pretty picture. It isn't just about who can take the best photograph. Um, But, you know, like all other techniques involved with filmmaking and storytelling, it's about communicating emotion and theme and story and significance um, and intimacy with the characters when that's necessary or distance from the characters when that's necessary about subconsciously affecting how uh, the audience feels and thinks when they're watching a film. Um, and that's, I mean, that's really the use of all of the technical techniques um, that come together to create really good films. And the most obvious one that everyone thinks of right off the bat is, is music, is score, because that's the one that's most affecting. I mean, music in and of itself can make you feel um, really strongly. It's so so closely connected to um, emotion. But cinematography, too, um, is not just about creating something pretty. It's, it's, it's about conveying that emotion. And in the case of um, Amores Perros, it definitely communicates that. It communicates the right tone. It communicates the right closeness to certain characters and the right distance from others. For instance, Octavio is always shown in a very close, very intimate setting. Um, or at least often shown that way to the camera, um, whereas his brother, who is more or less his antagonist in the uh, the the first segment, along with one other guy, um, is is kept at a distance mostly. He doesn't get too close to the camera. He he remains far away. And decisions like that can affect uh, the interpretation of a film by an audience. So yeah, let's uh, take a step out of the confusing complex. Um, labyrinth of a plot for Amores Peros. And let's talk about our final film of this week, Pan's Labyrinth from 2006. Jonathan, do you want to explain that one? Uh, Yes. So Pan's Labyrinth, which uh, technically has nothing to do with Pan, (laughs) which we'll get to. It follows the story of a little girl and her mother as they go to live with uh, Vidal, who is a captain in the Spanish fascist army, um, and also Ophelia's uh, new stepfather because he has married her mother after her biological father dies. Um, and so her mother is very pregnant and um, it kind of chronicles as they begin living on this uh, army base, essentially. Like a converted old meal, mill up in yeah. the mountains as this fascist... Um, like regiment of like cavalry or whatever is trying to root out the last of the uh, uh, Spanish guerrillas who they were fighting in the war up in these mountains. 
Right. And as all of that is going on, Ophelia finds um, this maze, this labyrinth in the garden and uh, is guided through it by a, a, a bug fairy and um, stumbles upon a fawn uh, who, I mean, that's where the translation of Pan comes from because uh, the Greek god Pan is often um, depicted as a fawn. And he tells her that she is a princess from this under realm, this kind of other realm who had escaped and now her spirit was coming back in the form of Ophelia, but she has to complete three tasks to prove that she is the princess. And so we follow her as Ophelia is going through these different tasks and as this drama of the you know fascist army and the rebels are um, having this this big fight and the two stories end up intertwining and um, you know having certain bearings on one another that gets into choices and fate and uh, destiny and all these kind of things with Guillermo del Toro's famous um, kind of dark and fantastical creatures and set design and um, just really beautiful way of telling a fantastical and dark story like you were saying dark fantasy yeah yeah and it, it definitely is that I, I feel like this is uh Guillermo del Toro um at his best in terms of fantastical storytelling um I mean if, if just if you enjoy fantasy as a genre like this is a highly enjoyable film incredibly fun to watch incredibly fun to watch these characters come to life um, he used a really great mix of practical and CGI effects to make them come to life. Um, Doug Jones, who played uh, both the fawn and the pale man, uh, did a fantastic job making them really unique and really creepy. Yeah. Like just just the way the fawn moves is so unique and unexpected um, that it sticks with you. Right. Um, and again, we're seeing traces of uh you know german expressionism in the way that the sets are designed and um especially uh the center of the labyrinth which has this very interesting feel and it's it everything in the sort of fantasy uh ophelia's storyline feels like you know moving illustrations from a fairy tale book or again like a folklore like we talked about with macario um it, it, everything feels very familiar and yet all of these creatures and designs are completely completely unique. Like we've seen a fawn before, but but this fawn is the um, is specific for this one. And the pale man feels like a lot of other legends. Like the, it kind of harkens back to the Cyclops from um, from the Odyssey and a lot of other children eating monsters. Uh, but it is completely unique. And that's kind of the the way that we stay invested in the story is the familiar feel without it necessarily being copying from other things, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's inspired by without just completely giving in to using old. Yeah, yeah. It's in, instead of just using like a Cyclops or a werewolf or... Um, anything from any of the monster pantheons out there, um, he kind of reinvents some of these here and there and makes tweaks to them so they're a little different. So you have fairies that are also praying mantises, and you have a fawn that moves like a rusted out um, robot, and you have a pale man, which is just odd, very odd yeah, a, um, a and weird, and is only in there for like five minutes, but is thoroughly frightening in that time right and we can <laughs> we can get into that now because i mean it's something about these images and things that kind of have per per percolated into the popular culture where i mean you know before either of us had seen pan's labyrinth we knew about the pale man um and even if we didn't know anything else about the movie like that image has kind of gotten itself everywhere especially if you've taken any kind of film classes and stuff like that you've probably seen at least a clip or an or an image but it's it's the way that those things can come out of a very small section of a movie that is so interesting 
Yeah, yeah. It's just the stuff that sticks in your head. And if anything, you could say that is what Del Toro is good at, is creating um, not only signature images, but signature uh, characters, which is perfect for fantasy. That's what you want. You want um, the fables you tell to stick in people's mind. And I feel like Pan's Labyrinth uh, achieves that. But it's also, at the same time, is is not just about the fantasy. Um, in fact, uh, you could really just interpret the film on one side that all of the fantasy is completely made up. It just exists within Ophelia's head and it's her escape from the other plot line, which is the war plot line. Um, because this is also definitely a war film and it has those deep, dark moments. Um, and it feels very much like a World War II film. It's not technically... Uh, because the Spanish Civil War was like a prelude to the the Second World War, um, but it is like fascists and that ideology and um, the the ideology the the thought that you should obey a command for the sake of obeying a command um, percolates not only through the the war realm of the story but also the fantasy realm of the story. And that's one of the big themes in the movie is this idea of obedience. Um, coming both from the servants to the fascists who are actually kind of undercover rebels and Ophelia's the servants, obedience. not the fascists. Right. And then on the other side, Ophelia um, basically taking commands from the fawn, even though, I mean, it's kind of her choice to take on the quests anyway. Um, but you have that going back and forth because each quest comes with its set of rules and whether or not she follows those by the book or not. And there's a, uh, a great video essay that kind of explores this idea that Pan's Labyrinth is um, what he calls a disobedient fairy tale because Ophelia does not always follow exactly the Fawn's instructions. And I'll include a link to that in the blog post. Um, but it, it goes into that and it also talks about how even though these two storylines are going parallel, you, it, the film kind of gives signals that doesn't make it easy to say, okay, the, the whole fairy storyline is just in Ophelia's imagination or, okay, the fairy, the fairy tale storyline is actually happening. It kind of goes back and forth and gives evidence on both sides of if it's actually real or if it's not. And can those two things happen simultaneously? Like a, <laughs> like a Schrodinger's labyrinth or something. <laughs> Schrodinger's Labyrinth. You only know until you die in it. Um, or you yep. don't know until you die in it. And the question of whether or not um, the the fairy side of the story is real is very interesting. And I think it's worth discussion um, because it's, it's this question of how we present reality and how do we perceive which real, reality as being true, um, both within... Um, uh, both within a film and in actual reality, um, <clears throat> Rashomon effect. <clears throat> um, <laughs> but I also don't think it's it's uber important to the question to to the enjoyment of this film or to the enjoyment of its meaning, um, because the ambiguity there is certainly uh, I feel intentional um, because it helps blend together the two storylines and helps hammer home the theme. Um, which, like we talked about before, has a lot to do with um, standing up to fascism or fascist rules um, or something along those lines. In fact, there's a quote uh, by Guillermo del Toro. Uh, he was talking about this film. I always think of that beautiful quote by Kierkegaard that says the tyrant's reign ends with his death, but the martyr's reign starts with his death. I think that is the essence of this movie. It's about living forever by choosing how you die. Which is great. There's a lot of choice about how you die over the course of the film. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to draw a line in the sand and say we're hopping on over it and we're in the spoiler section of this podcast now. So this last little uh, bit of the Pan's Labyrinth section will include spoilers because it's important to say that almost everybody in this film dies, um, except for a few of the Spanish gorillas and... Um, the the maid who is uh, a servant girl who is se secretly working for the Spanish guerrillas and Ophelia's little brother and the the two 
um, I think the, the antagonist and the protagonist of the film, on one hand, you have Ophelia being the protagonist, and on the other hand, you have Captain Vidal um, as the antagonist, and they both die at the end of the movie. And they both have a certain choice about how they die. And one is, in effect, the martyr, and one is, in effect, the tyrant. And um, how, how they, they go out says a lot about them. Right, and those aren't the... Like, those two deaths happen at the very end of the film, um, but there are others throughout the film. Like, a couple of the um, rebels are captured and uh, tortured, and the doctor who is helping them um, ends up dying because he won't obey. And those are really poignant moments um, where they take a firm stand against the tyrant and they pay for it. And the, the moment when the doctor dies and he just keeps walking towards the camera for several steps after he's been shot um, is one of those deaths that really sticks with you because, you know, to his last breath, he was distancing himself from that kind of tyranny and that kind of fascism. Um, and that's one of the things we haven't talked a lot about the, you know, the... Um, the fascist side of the story, if you will, as opposed to Ophelia's side. Um, but that side is, is very brutal. Like Vidal, everything we see of him, um, or I should say, I should say Guillermo del Toro doesn't avert the camera when terrible things are happening. It, when people are being shot in the head, he's holding on it. When someone's, you know, when things are very gory, are happening he's showing it to us because that's the brutality of war um and that that goes into this idea that even though half of the story is from ophelia's point of view and it looks like a fairy tale and if you watch the trailer for this film you might think that it you know might be like a kid's film or something even though it is rated r uh but it's really not it's a story for adults that uses this kind of fairy tale strain to wrap in and just hammer home these themes of uh unquestioning obedience to um tyrants and fascists who who may be stronger regardless of uh if they're right or not um and the other interesting thing is the fact that um ophelia disobeys the fawn even though she doesn't really have like the fawn isn't an antagonist she doesn't have a lot of reason to disobey and that's one of the things like i kind of want your opinion on because the first time i watched it you know her motivations for the various points when she disobeys are kind of left vague and i wasn't sure what to make of them and i probably just need to watch the movie a couple more times um but i thought that that was interesting because the motivations for disobeying are so clear-cut on the other side of the story yeah yeah and i think that might uh in some ways, uh, be the point is that I feel like in, in the modern world, at least so many people understand why fascism is wrong and why you wouldn't, uh, why you wouldn't obey for the sake of, uh, obeying when fascism is considered. But if you take it to another place where, um, disobed where, where you consider disobedience to maybe just be an inherent human trait and to be something that we're prone to do, especially children um because anyone with kids anybody's worked with kids anybody who's been a kid knows um so basically i just described everyone uh, <laughs> knows that uh children uh disobey it's it's what they do and most adults disobey too as as much as um uh, parents would like to convince children otherwise and that maybe that that disobedience isn't an entirely bad thing um and and maybe it doesn't always deserve to be punished uh, because I, I will say the grape thing, even though I get it now in retrospect, the, the grape thing, the part where Ophelia eats the grape and w awakens the pale man and has to escape him after that is incredibly frustrating because there's yeah. no reason. There didn't seem to be a reason to eat the grape at all. Um, but she did it anyway, and then she survived. And then later on, when the fawn asks for a prick of her blo brother's blood, um, you know, that 
that seems, I, I don't know, it, it's weird. It feels like just a prick of blood shouldn't be a big deal, but also like at that point I wouldn't trust the fawn either. So it makes more sense. And then it's all revealed that it was all just a big elaborate test, even more elaborate than the um, uh, explicit um, elaborate test that was involved. So she was supposed to be disobeying when she refused to hand over her brother. So maybe she was supposed to be disobeying when she ate the grape too. Who knows? Um, it's all left into uh, left in this very mysterious state. But I would say even if her motivations aren't super clear cut, um, the the fact that she disobeys along at the same time that the servants who are spying against the fascists and the guerrillas up in the mountains uh, refuse to surrender um, ties together the theme and the significance of, of, of the disobedience in the film a lot better. Yeah, and just to backtrack for a second, when you, when you mention um, her disobedience of Pan wanting to take the prick of blood, I kind of have to wonder, you know, if that is even how the last test would have happened had she obeyed the fairy and put the key in the right door in the pale man's cavern um because we don't know what item was in there like the i almost feel like those three choices kind of determine the ending and since she picked the one with the knife in it that's how it ended up i don't know it it just raises all these questions every kind of choice in this movie raises a whole host of questions of you know what would have happened if it had gone this way or what would have happened if she had made a different choice and that's one of the i mean that's is the running theme of the film and i think it presents it in such a way that you you can't have a definite answer you can only pull um kind of the the general generalities out of it you can't say specifically oh yeah, she was supposed to do this or she wasn't supposed to do this or this choice um, is the only way that would have led to this or whatever. It's it's so, again, complicated and, uh, you know, just ambiguous at some points that it, it leaves a lot of room for discussion like we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. And that ambiguity uh, certainly lends itself um, to the longevity of the film and uh, the longevity of it in popular culture. Um, and with audiences and it sticking around in brains as well as you know the the symbolism and the imagery that uh, Guillermo del Toro can cook up um, that all those questions raised by the film stick with you and uh, that is what makes a film like Pan's Labyrinth stick around for at least 11 years so far and we'll see how long it goes um it, it was a very successful film, and I bet, um, you know, one day after Del Toro is gone, someone's going to try to remake it, and we'll see how that goes. I often have that dread thought that somebody's going to try to remake something. and Maybe you know, maybe before Del Toro is gone. I mean, there are a lot of things being remade before. while the maker, the original maker is still, uh, is still around that do That's not true. need to be remade. Anyway... <laughs> Um, let's talk about overall notes and first and foremost, let's talk about the idea of fate. Um, and we talked about it a little bit in the intro and I think we talked about it a little bit in, over the course of our three films in specific, but, uh, I don't think we, we pulled it together. So just to go over each film in specific in Macario, uh, there's this fate that we get at the very end of the film, um, where, uh, death reveals to Macario that he's his candle is almost burned out. The candle that represents his life is almost burned out, and he's going to die. And then, well, surprise, we're in the spoiler section. He dies. Um, and we we go way back to the early part of the film where he was sharing um, his turkey with death, like 25 minutes into the film, 30 minutes into the film, and his wife finds him dead there. And that not only makes it feel very twilighty. Twilight Zoney, but it makes it feel like this was his inevitable fate was to have this experience and he was fated to die at this particular point because that's when his candle burned out and there's no escaping it. Um, in Amoris Peros, uh, the fate, the idea of fate comes through when we uh, look at the intertwining of the three um, 
of the three storylines and how these characters um, were almost required, almost bound to interact with each other. And after interacting with each other, they changed um, their outlook on life moving forward. And then finally, in Pan's Labyrinth, I feel like that the fate is pretty obvious. She is fated to be the princess, um, as well as the uh, Captain Vidal's uh, idea that he will die at the same time his father died. Um, and his father left him a watch that is broken and turned to the time um, when he died on a battlefield. And he's obsessed with dying at that time eventually. Yeah, and or at least, you know, carrying on the idea of telling his son what time he died or whatever. But also Pan's Labyrinth brings in this idea that, you know, your choices determine your fate, but then kind of undermines it. So it's, I mean, again, Pan's Labyrinth is so complicated <laughs> in its thematic uh, implications. Yeah, um, yeah. And we didn't talk about it too much this week because uh, our intention wasn't to create a fate theme. We, we just kind of did. Right. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's very interesting look at all of these films and we're not this week pulling out, uh, we're not looking at a specific movement like we did in Italy or France. And we're not really getting this big sense of, you know, what Mexican film is like, like we did, um, with India, you know, whether that was accurate or not. Uh, but we are seeing a lot of very good filmmakers. And the interesting thing to me is that a lot of these filmmakers have kind of, um, that start in Mexico kind of move into the Hollywood realm. And, you know, two of the three directors that we're talking about this week are very big in Hollywood right now, uh, with NRE two doing, uh, Birdman and the Revenant and, uh, you know, his cinematographer, um, shooting films like passengers and silence and Guillermo del Toro, who is still making a lot of things, uh, as far as Pacific Rim and Crimson Peak, and he will be directing the upcoming uh, Disney live action Pinocchio. Um, and then there are others uh, that we didn't talk about this week who have come from Mexico, like Alfonso Cuaron and Emmanuel Lebeski, um, who get their start in Mexico and come. And actually, I tend to get uh, Inarito and Alfonso Cuaron mixed up in my brain because they often, they've both worked with Emmanuel Lebeski and several of the actors from Morris Peros have been, um, were in Alfonso Cuaron's first feature film, which is E2 Mama Tambien. And so they, they share a lot of this, like, um, they kind of run in the same circles in a lot of ways. And, but they've both made extremely good careers for themselves. And, uh, we're seeing a lot of good directors come from Mexico and, you know, directors who have had good careers in Mexico, regardless if they're from there or not, like Robert Rodriguez and um, Louis Bunuel, like we've, like we've talked about. So it's an interesting thing to look at, you know, not the most discussed country as far as film, but it definitely has um, its place at the table. Yeah, yeah, it definitely um, you know, unlike India, it, it revolves in that Western uh, world of, of cinema, regardless of language. And since it's so darn close to the U.S. and L.A. in particular, it's not a, a huge shock that so many um, really talented filmmakers from Mexico end up working in Hollywood, too. And we also talked about um, expressionism once or twice today. Um, and my personal favorite from the week was in Pan's Labyrinth at the very end scene where we see Ophelia's soul return to the Underrealm and reunite with her mother and her father, the queen and king. Um, and they are just sitting in this ridiculous throne room, <laughs> just way over the top. And they're sitting on these really, really tall thrones, like 20 30 feet. feet tall, like yeah. just yeah, but it, but it, like weirdly futuristic, almost like IKEA style thrones. Um, it's odd. It's odd. It's grand and it's over the top, but it, it emphasizes their status and the grandness of this accomplishment that Ophelia's soul has made it to um, to this realm in this status. Um, and that is very expressionistic because guess who also likes really tall chairs? Expressionism, <laughs> and they also use them to do a very very similar thing with exaggerated sets. And um, I don't want to get too much into it this week because we're talking about Mexico, but it's there and it's definitely very interesting to look at. 
Right. And the other expressionist point that we mentioned today is, uh, which I couldn't talk about before, but at the very end of Macario, um, when death is taking him through this room full of candles, which uh, signify each person's life, but they're in this big cave, uh, this very dark and, um, you know, has a lot of shadow play going on. Uh, and it's very expressionistic. So now that we've teased our expressionism discussion to learn more about it, you'll have to tune in next week. And Alex, tell us what films we'll be talking about next week. That's right, Jonathan. The next stop on the world tour is Germany. And we're going old school. I mean, really old school, like the oldest films we've ever talked about on this podcast. The first of which is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari from 1920. The next film is Nosferatu from 1922, a.k.a. Dracula. And the third and final film we're going to talk about next week is Metropolis from 1927. Yeah, so Metropolis can be found on Netflix, and the other two, I mean, these films are so old that they're public domain, uh, and you can find many copies of them on YouTube and archive.org, and I'll include some links to them uh, in the blog post this week and also on our Twitter account, at the film links. Right, and uh, both The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu are streaming currently on Amazon Prime as well, if you want to check them out. Um, I would not worry too much if you're going to go watch them about whether or not it's tinted or not and whether or not it has this kind of music or that kind of music. Although I swear if you watch the heavy metal version of Metropolis, uh, we will ban (laughs) you from the podcast. Um, Not that I have anything against heavy metal. I have things against heavy metal Metropolis. But that will be part of the discussion next week. It will be a very interesting one and a very different one than we're used to here on Uh, the filmlings with some very interesting and unique films that have had a wide range of impact on the film industry and the art of cinema in general. Yeah, and these are our first, and it'll be a whole week of silent films. So, uh, you know, for whatever that's worth, go watch these films, get used to silent films, because uh, they are our artistic ancestors and they are very entertaining and we'll talk about the different techniques that they used that we're not so familiar with anymore that's right get used to silent films but don't get used to silent podcasts because we'll be back but that's about all the time we have in mexico for now if you have movie suggestions for us or just want to reach out i can be found on twitter at at js satchel and i'm at alex Geringer. And to find links to things that we talked about today, you can view them on the blog at thefilmlinks.com. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next week. All right, I will see you in Deutschland. So, oh gosh, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Uh, But diapers commercials are classy baby nudity.